Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. On today's episode of Founder University, we have two talks. The first one is by Presh from Launch. You might remember him from episode one, where he broke down how to set up retargeting. Well, if you haven't watched it, go check it out right now. Founder University episode one. Today, he's going to talk about building no code SaaS applications. You're going to learn about the best tools to use, how to ship your MVP or your version one, all without writing one line of code. And after that, we have Scott Beaver from NetSuite. He's going to talk about what startups should consider when adding subscription services. Very important topic. You're going to learn about pricing models and which subscription models work best for your startup. Okay, let's get into it, everybody. Hey, everyone. I'm Presh, and today we're going to walk through how to build no-code apps. So first, we're going to talk about why build no-code apps in the first place. We'll cover things like who is it for, and then we'll jump into some of the pros and cons. Uh, next, we'll talk about some of the best tools to use when building in no-code, and these are going to vary depending on what you want to build. So hopefully after watching this presentation, you'll have a better understanding of what no-code is capable of, and then you can get started on third base picking your platform. And lastly, we'll wrap on some of my favorite resources uh, in the no-code community um, to help you further your education. So let's get into it. So why build no-code apps in the first place? It's going to come down to two things. So one, you're non-technical or non-technical yet. And two, you want to move quickly. For example, you have an idea and you want to put that idea in the marketplace as quickly as possible. Test and see if it's worth pursuing. Over the next couple of slides, I'm going to show you how before even building your product, you can utilize some cool tools to get to the third base of building your product. So using no-code tools to start this process of building your product might look like this. Step one, you get your idea. Step two, you might want to share that idea or validate it a bit. And this can be done by tweeting it, writing a blog post, or sharing it in a subreddit. Step three, you might want to start making a mock-up of your product with tools like Figma or Canva or Sketch. Uh, and I include design tools in no code because they've really designed them so anyone can learn them quickly. Um, and they're just delightful and fun to use. That's step four. Okay, now your product mock-up is done. So it's time to build a simple landing page. And remember, the goal of this is to put something out there and see if there's interest of the product. So it's not mandatory to have a overly designed website. So I use tools like Webflow, or maybe even Notion, Squarespace, Card, step five. Okay, so now the website is up. And we want to start capturing people who visit the site that might be interested in the product. So we can do this with a simple email capture tool. And I like to use MailChimp in this case, step six. And lastly, with the emails, we can now start funneling customers or potential customers into a community uh, with products like Slack, or Discord, or even Twitter. Keep the conversation going and keep your potential customers engaged. Now we're going to talk about the pros of no-code development. And I've narrowed it down to three things. Agile development, low to no maintenance, and cost efficiency. So in terms of being agile, you can put out an MVP as soon as you have the idea. And you just need to do it with one person, which is yourself. You don't need a whole team. Next, there's no maintenance. Since you're building on top of platforms and ideally big ones with big teams, we're piggybacking our product on them. And so they manage the maintenance for you and, and updating everything. And lastly, it's cost effective to a point because you don't need to hire developers, which are expensive. Moving on to the cons of no code, you're dependent on the platform you build on. So if one day they wake up and decide to remove a feature, that you use every day, you might be at a disadvantage there. And lastly, it can get expensive. Again, depending on if you're using multiple tools, you want to be thoughtful with the kinds of tools that you're using. Now we're going to talk about the tools you might want to use when building no code apps and what's actually possible. Let's get into it. So to start the first decision we need to make is what type of product do we want to build? Uh, do we want to build a simple website with a gated community slash paywalled content? Or do we want to build a marketplace type of business similar to Airbnb, where it's two sided, you got a supply side, a demand side, and you want transactions to occur? Or do we want to build a mobile application for maybe the App Store or the Play Store? So there are tools for all of these examples, and we'll dive in deeper right now. Let's start with a simple subscription website or subscription business. These are three tools that will get you started and you can build an entire business off the back end of this. So the first is Webflow, which is the visual no-code website designer that I mentioned earlier. And this is popular now because you can customize fully and they've got beautiful templates. The next is a tool called MemberStack. And what this allows you to do is allow your website to have a sign-up portal or dashboard and allow you to charge customers either one-time payment or a subscription model. Um, so really turning your website more into like an app uh, or community. And lastly is Zapier, which is an automation slash API tool that allow you to connect and talk to different applications. So you can have your Webflow website, talk to member stack, and you can do that through Zapier. So here I'm just on Webflow's template website, and you can see they've got beautiful designs here 
I'm in one example called London and I can buy this if I want to use it. But you can see it looks like a very professional website here. Uh, it's got nice animations, nice colors, and this looks like, you know, it would cost tens of thousands of dollars to build, but you can replicate this with just a click of a button. Okay, now here we are on MemberStack. Again, MemberStack allows you to create like a sign up portal and create a login for your users on your Webflow site. And so here you'll see this login portal. That's kind of an example of what it would look like. And then you've also got a pricing page. So that's, you know, if you want to charge or put up a paywall for some of your content, you can do that as well. Here's an example with one of our portfolio companies, Soul Savvy, and they initially started with just completely no code tools. So you'll see their website, you know, you can go in, you can sign up for the waitlist, or you can skip the waitlist and put your information and sign up. All of this can be done within Webflow and member stack. Lastly, on the subscription website stack, we have Zapier, which is the king of automation and connecting different apps to talk to each other. So you'll see in the screenshot, they've got thousands of integrations, uh, into all the main apps like Google Sheets, MailChimp, Calendar, Slack, Typeform, Stripe, and so on. So the main purpose for Zapier is for apps to interact with each other. Moving on to a marketplace type product, these tools will get you started right out of the box. So the first one is Softer.io, and the second one is Bubble.io. And both of these will get you on third base because you can use some of their marketplace templates. And the best examples I'll show you here are Airbnb clones on both platforms. All right, so here I am on Softer.io, and they've also got a great template library. I'm going to go to one of their examples here, co.live. And this is a marketplace example built right on the platform. And so you can see you've got some houses here that you can click into. Um, you've got a search feature, you've got explore spaces, and you can even go as far as booking a spot on the platform. And that'll take you to like a landing page or Stripe, a Stripe powered page to complete the transaction. This is another example using the bubble platform. So again, another marketplace type product, you can see you've got different locations here, you can even create your own listing. Um, and so again, designed beautifully, works perfectly, and you're building this from scratch, but you can also use a template and get you again on that third base. Lastly, moving on to mobile app development in the no-code ecosystem, there are two main tools that I've used, and the first one is Bravo Studio, and that's bravostudio.app, and the other one is glideapps.com. The first one, which is Bravo Studio, is more of a visual designer, so you can use Figma or Adobe XD to design your app. And so what Bravo Studio does is it connects those elements together to make into actions. So you're basically leveling up your prototype to be a functional product. The other app I've used is called Glide and Glide allows you to create web-based uh, but mobile-friendly apps to do powerful things like create management tracking tools or a conference app or a workout app. And I've even seen a template for an Instagram clone. Now let's wrap up with some resources you can use to learn more about building no-code products. So the main resources that I like to use are makerpad.co and nocode.tech. And both of these sites have extensive libraries of content that you can get started from beginner all the way to advanced. And you can see on this screenshot, you can start as, you know, as basic as just creating websites or you can go to building mobile apps. And again, this is all no code, so they've got you covered. And that's gonna wrap today's episode of how to build no-code apps. Thanks for listening. What startups should consider when adding subscription services. Hi, I'm Scott Beaver, Senior Product Marketing Manager with Oracle NetSuite. The subscription economy is growing rapidly, by some estimates as much as 68% compound annual growth rate. And it's also estimated that as much as 75% of companies that sell direct to consumers will implement or have implemented a subscription service within the next two to three years. Given that the popularity the uh, benefits include predictable, more predictable recurring revenue, giving more stable financials, and the opportunity to access to customers that couldn't normally buy your products or services up front. There are obviously a lot of benefits. There are some challenges, however, to implementing this model. And today we're going to talk about the top five of those. The first question is, what pricing model are you going to use when you begin providing your subscription? So what are the most common pricing models? There are really four. The most typical one, the easiest one to ma manage is the flat pricing model. I think we're all familiar with that. If you have a Netflix subscription or Apple TV or Hulu, you're used to paying that once a month fee. Same way that um, you know traditional publications like magazines, newspapers, you pay a fixed fee. It's always the same. That's probably the easiest one to administer. But there are a few other models, though, that are becoming more and more common. Particularly in the software industry, you have the per user or per module based, where for every person using or accessing the software, there's going to be a fee. And then as you add functionality, there are additional fees. So in this case, 
I've got paying, would be paying $50 for five users. And then there are, each one of those has an additional add on module. So my total is $65 a month. And that's for that basic subscription. Another option is a tiered based subscription. Another technology example here would be if I'm purchasing online storage. So my volume pricing gives me $2.50 per gigabyte for up to a hundred gigabytes and anything over that I'm paying a dollar. And then finally, the most complex or complicated approach is what we refer to as variable pricing. So I may have a fixed monthly fee that gives me certain access, such as for a mobile phone, I may have a data plan or the cellular service, mobile service plan where I get so many minutes to use my phone. And then anything over that, I'm paying a, an additional rate. There are multiple challenges here, but the, the more complex the model, the more difficult it is to administer with the various models. For instance, how are you, am I going to track the actual numbers of users? Is it named users? So do you have to, add, is it per person logged in or is it five contiguous users? So five people can access the application at a time. With tiered, I need to know at what point my customer goes over the volume we've agreed to. And then with that variable, I need to keep close track of their actual consumption because billing errors are a problem. Customers dispute those that leads to unhappy customers and it also delays their payment. So you can, you know, it definitely affects cash flow. The next big challenge, once you move to a subscription model, is managing the billing process, the billing cycle. With a one-off sales model, you bill the customer when they buy. But with a subscription model, again, the, the goal is to have recurring revenue. And so there's recurring billing. You may be billing monthly or quarterly instead of that one time, that one transaction. And so that's going to increase the workload on your accounts receivable staff who have to you know send those bills out. You also have to decide, am I going to bill in advance or am I going to bill in arrears? And in the case of consumption, you're most often going to be billing consumption-based or variable charges. You're most often going to be billing in arrears. And then there's the issue of, do I have a credit card? Is that how I charge my, my customers? Well, I can do that for certain things depending on the price point, but there are additional security concerns that I have to take into account to manage those cards. If I'm Billing via invoicing, then I have to, there's the whole uh, collections process. I have to make sure the customer pays, particularly if I'm billing in arrears. If I'm billing in advance, then I can simply just not provide service. But if I'm billing in arrears, then I've got to make sure that they pay in a timely manner. So our third challenge is subscription billing, subscription plans have an impact on your accounting process, particularly if you normally sell products. When you begin selling subscription, you're going to have to deal with the revenue recognition. So if I've got a 12 month subscription, I can't recognize all of that revenue at once. I have to recognize it over 12 months. Well, the customer may be paying me at the beginning of the, of the year. Somehow I have to manage that cash and manage that uh, recognition of that revenue over that period. And the same goes with it, whether it's a quarterly or payment or a monthly charge. I still have revenue recognition implications. There can also be tax implications. Revenue recognition changes. Again, if you've Particularly if you've been dealing in a cash environment with revenue recognition issues, you're going to have to switch to an accrual based accounting if you haven't been using that in the past. So that changes your accounting process and that changes how you report your income. And then finally, in some industries, I maybe have to start collecting sales tax. Several states require sales tax for digital software downloads. So if I'm, if I sell software, I may be responsible for collecting sales tax on that. Now, even though it's a subscription base. So that's something that you may not have had to do before that adds another level of complexity to the accounts payable and to your accounting process. Our fourth challenge is managing subscription changes. Number one, you're going to have customers or subscribers who want to put their subscription on hold. How am I going to manage that? That's a customer service requirement. They're also going to have customers for whatever reason who call in to cancel for one reason or another. How am I going to manage that? Just as importantly, you're going to have hopefully opportunities to upsell uh, subscribers. Maybe you have additional services and for an additional fee, they can get those. Maybe you have a, a basic service and a premium service. So how am I going to manage those upsells and just as importantly, those downsells? That's also a customer service requirement. I'm going to have to have some way of managing that process. Um, what we refer to as the change order process. How do I manage those changes? Ensure I'm billing the customer correctly for the services they're using. We're not billing them if they decide to put their subscription on hold to downgrade their service or to cancel. And then an additional part of this is how am I going to manage things like promotions? Many subscriptions will offer a discount for the first, say, six months or the first year or maybe a, a free trial period of three months. At some point, though, that, that pricing is going to change. 
I have to have an automated process for making that change uh, to ensure that I'm billing my customer again the correct amount. And then I also tack onto that a need to have a process for managing renewals to make sure I don't in- lose those customers through what we refer to as an involuntary churn. They forget to renew, you forget to remind them, and you lose that customer who was otherwise satisfied and would have gone on paying for your service. And then finally, we have the question of what metrics are we going to use to track performance? It's difficult to manage something if you can't measure it. And so any recurring revenue-based model comes with additional KPIs that we need to track. The most important or some of the most important of those are going to deal with your monthly recurring revenue. You want to monitor what the growth rate is, and you want to make sure you're monitoring the net growth rate. And by net growth I mean rate, I mean you're taking into account how much revenue did I lose due to customer churn, subscriber churn. So monthly recurring revenue, monthly recurring growth, and monthly recurring revenue churn. Churn is the the big enemy for a subscription-based business model. I want to do anything I can to reduce that. Customer service, again, becomes a very important issue. You need to monitor why customer, you may be losing customers. Is it a competitive reason? Is your pricing out of sync with the market? Or are they are they not getting the value? So pay very close attention to that uh, churn rate. And you're going to be looking at both the number of subscribers you lose per month, what the total revenue you lose per month, and the percentage of revenue uh, as a percentage of your total monthly recurring revenue. You're also going to have other subscriber-driven metrics. In addition to that churn rate, customer or subscriber acquisition cost is a very important metric, and you've got to have a way of tracking that data. And then you're also going to look look at the average lifetime value of a subscriber, and that can affect some of your revenue recognition policies as well. To do that, you're going to need to know what is the average length of my customer relationship or subscriber relationship, not the average length of an individual subscription, but that you know, total relationship. So maybe it's a 12 year, a 12 month subscription. But if I have that a customer on average for three years, then that's my duration and how much, not just how much revenue do I bring in from that customer, but what's the actual margin? So I should be doing this, um, average subscriber lifetime value, which again is what's the average incremental profit that I bring in per subscriber over the life of that, that subscriber. So those are the most common or most important metrics to keep in mind when I'm implementing a subscription-based model. So there it is, just to recap, when I'm looking or considering implementing a subscription-based service offering, there are five big challenges I need to keep in mind and plan for in advance of going to market. Number one, the complexity of the plan, what it is I'm actually offering and how I'm going to price that. And making sure I price appropriately for whatever it is I'm delivering. Number two, moving to subscript a subscription model is going to increase the workload for your accounts receivable staff. They're going to have to send up, generate bills more frequently. You also have to look at what the billing process is, whether it's in advance or in arrears. And you may have to consider whether you need to bring on additional uh, personnel to manage that. Again, number three is the tax and uh, revenue rec- recognition implications. Revenue rec- recognition is particularly challenging if you've never done it before. And so having to allocate when the revenue actually hits the books. And it also has, again, impacts on cash management because just because you get that cash at the beginning of the quarter or beginning of the year doesn't mean it's going to always be there, right? So you have to manage your, your finances a little bit differently. And then ultimately, there could be sales tax uh, collection implications as well as income tax reporting implications for a subscription based model. The fourth challenge to recap is. Managing those change orders. What am I going to do? Am I going to have to hire additional service people? How am I going to communicate those changes so that accounting knows how much to bill that customer for? So that requires some planning and attention. And then finally, what KPIs am I going to track? I know what metrics are important now, but how am I going to gather that data? So now that you know a little bit more about what you need to think about and some of the challenges you might face with uh, managing a subscription-based revenue stream. I'll tell you a little bit about NetSuite. So we're the number one cloud-based ERP solution provider with over 32,000 customers worldwide. And one of our capabilities is, is a fully functional subscription management solution called NetSuite Suite Billing that allows you to overcome all of these challenges to manage the billing frequency, manage the security if you happen to be using credit cards, managing that uh, uh, dunning process, or collecting from clients, 
and also manage those change orders. So it's a built-in suite, fully functional, that works with the rest of our accounting solution. If you like a free product tour of NetSuite, please check out our website at www.netsuite.com. Okay, that's a wrap for today's episode. And if you want to see more tactical content, be sure to hit the subscribe button on YouTube or your favorite podcast player. If you want to rate and subscribe, that's great. And if you've got an idea right now and you're inspired to build an MVP or an idea that you want to build into an actual company, just apply to my 12-week course, Founder University at founder.university slash apply. It's free to uh, come to the Founder University if you come to all 12 weeks. And we invest $25,000 in the top graduates to help them grow even more. Again, you can apply for the upcoming cohort, founder.university slash apply. And if you would like to give a tactical talk here on this pod, you can submit your presentation at founder.university slash submit.